to, to just quickly spend um, uh, uh, 5 or 10 minutes recalling what we did yesterday. But even before that, I wanted to say that, you know, why should we be studying a simple model like this? Um, the answer is that it is because it is simple, that is why we want to study the model of this sort. It is also a paradigm. It is a paradigm of random motion and what can happen as a result of randomness. And paradigm means simply that, you know, it is a model that is simple and well studied. Not that it explains in detail, you know, the particular phenomenon that you may have in mind, but because it is a paradigm, you, you can compare, you know, any system that you have with it. It may not work perfectly, but then it provides an anchor. It provides an anchor of something that you know for sure, and then you can work away from that. You know, how do I need to improve the model away from this, or what have you? And so, so the real reason for studying it is it's a simple model with non-trivial uh, behavior, and it behooves us to understand that first before we study more complicated things. So, so this is the. Uh, uh, reason we study this. And of course, I mean with some embellishments, it applies immediately to many, many phenomena in physics uh, that we know of. Uh, the first and important uh, example of course, is Brownian motion. Brownian motion, the, the colloidal particles do not actually do random walks of the exact so sort we talked about, but they do move randomly. And here we have a simple model which we are analyzing, which is like that. So, Brownian motion is uh, uh, an example, maybe the motivating example for a lot of work in this area and to start with. And uh, maybe uh, in the next couple of lectures or lecture or the lecture after that, we will discuss a more realistic model, namely the Langevin equation for the motion of a uh, particle subjected to uh, viscous forces and noise in a liquid. But random walk is a good starting point. <coughs> Second, it is a model of something, you know, I am just uh, saying of the following sort. Suppose you have a crystal and you have atoms everywhere, here they are, the atoms. You know, even in the best of crystals that you make, sometimes you have a vacancy. There is no atom there. It can happen does happen. Okay. In which case, of course, uh, because you have a finite temperature in a little while, maybe this atom will jump here, but then of course, this vacancy will move there. right? So, here the vacancy has jumped. So, you can think of the vacancy rather than the atoms you know, as the mobile object. And then if you think about it, the vacancy is doing random walk on in the lattice. Now, uh, so, um, just to tell you about a physical example where this might happen or completely different system. Let us think about uh, a polymer. Your long polymer is made of, it is a long molecule made of many you know, uh, smaller components called monomers. And so, if I were to pictorially think about a polymer, this is the way it looks. Right? Now, if I imagine each of these as a step in a random walk. This is actually the conformation of the polymer. It is not in time, it is there in space. But if I want to describe the shape of the polymer or something about the end to end distance or its moment of inertia or something like that, you know, uh, the trajectory of a random walk is the first, you know, model you might think of. Of course, it is not a very, very good model because random walk can have self intersections, polymers cannot. Even so, it tells you a lot and it is a working model, it is a good start for a lot of work on polymer physics. So, not that random walks need defending, but I wanted to say that it is really a valuable model in many senses and should be uh, studied a lot. Of course, very literally the left and right steps that a random walk uh, Walker takes can immediately be mapped onto any two level system. For instance, a coin, toss a coin, you get heads or tails, right. So, as I said, 
there is an immediate mapping between a particular realization of a random walk and a particular sequence of coin tossing and uh, therefore, it relates to other sorts of matters let us say gambling you know. Uh, and then there are other examples which I have written down, but let me not spend time on the, but it is a useful model. Now, yes. 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 That is right. What is the corresponding question when the mapping was going to this? Ah, um, well, something yes. Uh, yes, not not so much to the mean squared movement, but to another question. Suppose we are playing, and okay, m maybe you don't gamble, but I but I do. <laughs> All right, okay. So we we talk, we begin heads and tails, and each time we exchange, let's say, fifty pesos, being <laughs> you know from our times. Okay. All right. Now it goes on and on. Suppose I begin to lose, you know the first first toss you have won. Question, what is the best strategy I should adopt? Should I get out of the game immediately? You know you, I would feel no, no, no I mean uh, let me at least equalize. But as I will show you today, the best strategy is to quit immediately. <laughs> yes, I will tell you the reason why. Okay, so this I pl plan to say a little later in the talk, but it is the following. Let us put it in random walk language. We are starting at the origin means we are both equal. If I move this way means you are winning. If I move this way, everyone. Now, suppose in the first one, I have moved here. The question is, what is the average time meaning average number of tosses I will need in order to come back? So, what would you think it is? Okay, so the answer is infinity. It takes infinite, on average, the time taken to return is infinite. It is a shocking statement. Put, put another way, if I am at the origin and I want to move one step right, what is the average time I take to go one step right? The answer is infinity. You might say, what is this? In the first, very first step, I have a 50 percent chance of going there. Yeah. You are right. But I am asking a very precise question. How long will it be before I reach there? I want the probability of reaching there after, for the first time after n steps and that average is infinite. So, coming back to gambling. Uh, so, there are two contradictory theorems in random walk theory. One is that you know uh, in one dimension if you leave you you will come back for certain to the point you started with provided your um, you wait till infinite time you are certain to return which uh, which won't happen in higher dimensions but it will happen in one however the time taken to come back is also infinite the average time so now coming back to the gambling Yes, if I want to make up, I will be able to do it provided I have infinite capital. So, so it depends, you know. So, there are lessons to be learnt and uh, I will show you actual sequences of coin tossing and what happens. Okay. So, so uh, I do not know. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. All right. So, yeah, good. Thank you for asking and anticipating, but uh, all right. Yeah, the mean squared displacement itself will not have much meaning. I mean, yeah. Okay. So, just to put on the blackboard what we quickly in a very quick way what we did last time, we said that after n steps the probability to be at site m is uh, we derive this 2 over root 2 pi n e to the minus half m squared by n and we said that in continuum space and time, continuous space and continuous time this corresponds to 1 over 4 pi 
d t e to the minus x squared over 4 d t with uh, the correspondence is n equal to r t. In other words, in a unit of time, I make r attempts to move. Uh, r is the rate of stepping out. X was m times a. m was the location as an integer. a was the lattice spacing. And the diffusion constant is half r a squared. There was a question later as to why are we introducing this diffusion constant. I will try to motivate it a little bit as we go ahead in the lecture. There were few implications we could draw immediately from this. One is that square root of x squared, the root mean squared displacement is proportional to the square root of time. The probability to be back at the origin in time t is root 4 pi d t. So, we have to be very precise and clear in our minds as to what question we are asking. So, when we write this, we are asking the question at a given time, what is the probability that we are at the origin? And this is the answer. The question we will ask later is at what time will I? reach something. Oh, so, that that will come to it. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, the condition is that sum over x exactly. Normalization makes you understand. So, the sum over x all x uh, p of x and t or an integral over x should be 1 at a fixed t. Yes. So, this is the uh, first and simplest question to ask and this is, this is the answer. The next shocking question we will ask also is not so hard to address. We will find the answer, but it is a different question. Right. And in the third, uh, third thing I wanted to say is you can generalize this immediately to three dimensions by looking at a random walk, let us say on a you know cubic lattice or something of that sort x y z equally likely and uh, then you find that p of r and t is 1 over 4 pi d t to the 3 by 2 e to the minus r squared over 4 d t. Okay, so, these are probability densities here. Okay, so, you can interpret them in the normal way by assigning cube of size d x d y d z in your vicinity. Then we went on to what we call random flights. And what we did was we pointed out that we can loosen up the restriction of taking walks with a given step length and instead talk about drawing the step length from a probability distribution of this sort with a given value maybe of the uh, well let us make it symmetric maybe it is like this so, with the given value of x squared which I will call sigma squared. Average x I am taking to be 0. Uh, it is not is an essential condition, but it is simple right now. It is simpler to do that. And then, of course, uh, since so, so this is understood as the distribution from which we draw each step. At this step, I go I draw something with this probability, I move with that step length, and so on and so forth. Then, clearly, after a certain number of steps, call it n, we have a displacement of x1, x2 up to xn, and the question is can we then find capital P of x. And the answer is yes or rather capital P of capital X and the answer is yes we can and we did it and the answer turned out to be 1 over root 2 pi n sigma squared e to the minus half x squared over n sigma squared. 
okay. We will go over this derivation one more time in the tutorial tomorrow, but uh, at the moment I just wanted to summarize the answers. This fact of course, is deeply and very intimately related to the central limit theorem of mathematics and that is another thing that we, we can discuss at length in the uh, lecture tomorrow, but this is a fact. And after class about 3, 4, 5 of you came separately to ask me I mean essentially am I sure that the answer is always Gaussian no matter how outlandish the initial p of x is and the answer to each of you was yes, yes, yes. It is, it is crazy and surprising and odd, but it is and we will try to show you also in the, I am sorry for billing my tutorial so much, but in the, <laughs> in, in the tutorial tomorrow some examples, so Weber has generated some where we start with you know strange distributions, but within a few iterations, zoop, yep. I mean what did I do? Zoop. Gaussian, that is what I was trying to do. Okay, so, we will see that happen. It is true, it is shocking, but true. Okay, all right, but not as shocking as what we will say today. All right, okay, fine. So, this is that, and now let me move over to the content of the lecture today. Now, I have to time myself because I have to, uh, because I do want to get to the shocking part eventually, but there are other things you should know before that. All right. So, we are going to discuss today biased random walks and as you, as you may imagine it is a simple uh, thing that we will do. We will just allow different probabilities for the right hop and the left hop and we will call them p and q we will keep the same p and q for all sides and all times and we will have p plus q equal to 1. In the model we dealt with yesterday, p and q are both equal to half. Today, they will be something else and we would like to see what happens as a result. Okay. Now, we are not going to do a combinatoric counting. See, just think yes, what did we do? we pose the question where are we going to be at time t, then we found a number of options and we found this probability distribution. The thing that was moving and doing the dynamics was really x, I mean the walker and then we saw where it was. Now, we will change our point of view and we will say ok that is fine, but can we write an equation of motion for the probability itself? At time 0 probability is a delta function then it is going to do various things. Can't, can't. So, that is what we will try to do. Okay, so, let us go ahead. To do that, we recall that to be at site m at time n plus 1, okay, I have to be uh, at site m minus 1 at time n and then with probability p move to the site in question or to be at m plus 1 at site n and move backward. In other words, to reach this site, I should have been here or there and moved in either this way or that way. Okay. So, this is fine. Now, let me go to a continuum description in the following way that uh, okay, so well, so what I will do is convert to x and t with those correspondences that I have written there by saying that this is after all being at site at point x at a time t plus 1 over r. If n corresponds to time t, there is one more step I have taken, but in terms of t that is 1 over r. Okay, So, that is equal to little p times capital P of x minus a m minus 1 at time t plus little q times p of x plus a at time t. And of course, you know what I will do, I will expand this as well. So, for instance, I will expand each of these terms to second order. For instance, this would become, I am going to write this as a d p by d x plus 1 half 
a squared d 2 p d x squared and stop there. So, is it clear what I am doing? I am just similarly I will do something for that and then I will add the 2 at which point I will get the equation 1 over r d p by d t. How do I get d p by d t? So, what I will do is I will subtract off p of x and t on both sides. So, imagine doing that. So, then this will go to a derivative and you know I will spread that one out with p times this and q times that in such a way. Shall I omit this step? I mean not write it as you, you can imagine it that I will get the equation q minus p times a times d p by d x plus one half a squared times d 2 p by d d x squared that is all. Let me multiply across this r. So, I will remove it from here and put it here and here. Okay. All right. So, there we are. So, this we will rewrite as c times uh, okay, minus c times d p by d x plus d times d 2 p by d x squared. So, d p by d t is this. So, this is a very nice equation. It is an first of all it is nice because it is an equation for p. p of x and t is a function okay, and this is telling you how the function is evolving in time. Okay, it is a direct equation for the probability itself. Moreover, it has a simple solution. You know, whenever you have a derivative term like this, you can remove it by Galilean shift. So, defining x prime equal to x plus c t will just remove this term if you rewrite the equation in terms of x prime. If you have removed this term, then you are left with just this. This is the familiar diffusion equation which you may have encountered in some context like heat conduction or something or the other, but in any case the solution is simple and uh, we will just write it right away. So, p of x and t is well you are used to it by now root 4 pi d t times the Gaussian except the Gaussian is centered not at 0, but because we have done this Galilean shift centered around the center of you know at that moment and at that, that, that moment the center is at c t. Simple. So, what the bias of the biased walkers is, is to impart a drift velocity right we have an ex, you know in terms of the actual microscopic model we have a formula for the drift velocity c is equal to uh, p minus q times a times r and d of course was there yesterday as well is r a squared so is the is it fairly clear any question Yes. Uh, we took two terms in huh. yes. Side, but only one in the right yes. Uh, is there a reason it suffices. I mean, <laughs> let me just put it that way. We do the minimums, that is sufficient. <coughs> you know, okay. So, in a, suppose you had not taken the second term here, you know, basically you would have gotten something that the solution would be that you have a delta function to start with and that delta function will move. It will get that part right. If you are interested in the broadening, it is essential to keep the next term. Right. So, 
No, so you should take a limit that that this actually approaches C, mm -hmm. and this approaches D. So this is the point that Shamik also pointed out yesterday. We have to take a limit actually to do it carefully, and this is the way to do it. So okay, let's see. A goes to zero. R goes to infinity. First of all, R A squared has to be constant when this happens. Third, P should go to Q in such a way that P minus Q times R times A stays by that. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Good point. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So there is a justification. I mean, if we take this limit. You know, but it, it, we have to take this limit. Okay, given this limit, it works. That's right. But here is the answer. This equation is sometimes called the diffusion drift equation, drift diffusion or diffusion drift equation. And there are two terms that matter. One is this speed, and one is the spread. Therefore, if we try to plot the function as we always should, I think the one message you should take away from this ref refresher course is plot. Just whatever you have, just keep plotting. Plot, plot. Yeah, right. Okay, sorry. So, let us plot. Yeah. So, here is x. Time t equal to 0, you are at the origin. What happens as a function of time? Well, you this broadens a little bit, I mean, this is supposed to be little and it has the center of gravity, I mean the peak has moved a little bit, later it will move more and later it will move even, even more and it will keep broadening, this broadening will be proportional to d t square root whereas this location will be proportional to c t. As t gets big, broadening is less than this. But in the beginning, what happens? Let us ask. You know, suppose you wanted to reach a point which is close by, do you reach it essentially by drift or by diffusion? Answer is by diffusion. Why? Because there is a time. You know, let us look at the what is the word? Units of C. That is centimeter per second, and of D centimeter squared. Okay, so you can divide one by the other, and you'll get a something of order centimeter, right? What what? So you should divide d by c. So d by c is a length. Okay, I don't know if I have a word for it. Okay, let me call it l d. For some reason, it's called the diffusion length. I mean, as if the drift didn't matter, but okay, it's the, this is the diffusion length l d by c. And obviously, there is a time you can associate with that. Now, how would you associate a time with L d? Well, you can do it in two ways. You can either say that this is a distance and there is a speed. So, time will be given by distance divided by speed. So, let us try that. So, what, what, will, you, what will you get L d divided by c? Or you could have said that look, I, I don't like speed, I want my diffusion constant. So then I'll take L d squared for the time divided by d because d t is the r squared. But fortunately these are equal. So it doesn't matter, you can do it either one. And this is tau d, some diffusion time, and that's equal to uh, d by c squared. Okay. So, the point I am trying to make is that there is a given a d and a c, there is immediately a lens that comes into the problem and then associated time. And if you are talking about distances which are smaller than that lens, then essentially diffusion dominates over drift, but once you have crossed that lens, drift sets in. I mean, there must be such a length just by continuity, like right. I mean, suppose C is very, very tiny. How does the system know there's a drift velocity? It doesn't know it's <coughs> diffusion. It's happily diffusing. It'll do what it does. Slowly, that effect of C will come in, and then at long times it'll win over. This is just a small point, but I wanted to make the point. So, P is R 
Uh, yes and no. I mean, if p is smaller than q, it will go the other way. I mean, either yeah, positive or negative. The sign is not so material. I mean, it will just determine which direction it goes. Right. Now, so somebody asked me whether biased random walk is a good model of what was it? Electrons or current in a wire? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, you know, uh, currents in typical metals uh, carried by electrons, which are fermions, and there's a good Fermi surface and so on, and those effects are being ignored here. It might be an okay model of traffic on the Grand Trunk Highway. You know, there's a current, there's a car current there, and uh, you can monitor how many cars are crossing per unit time. Uh, and you can talk about the car. And this may not be such a bad model. Of course, it's not a very good model either, because cars cannot overtake. I mean, can cars cannot go through each other. So the, a better model will be where you have many random walkers, each one trying to go rightward, but not able to go if there's something there blocked. The, turns out this is a very well-known model, and very well studied in the last 20 years. This is called the asymmetric simple exclusion process. Exclusion obviously because the cars exclude each other. You can't put a car on top of it. Asymmetric was moving one way. Uh, okay, so that's why it's called that. And uh, it ha ha captures, I would say, it caricatures many of the effects of real traffic in not such a bad way. So these rather primitive models are not so bad. In fact, I'm t tempted to tell you a quick story. Let me just do it. I didn't think I would. But uh, you know, there are two people in uh, Germany, Nagel and Schreckenberg, statistical physicists, who thought they will try to actually model <coughs> traffic on highways using such more or less simple models, except it can't be that simple as this. They put in some acceleration and they put in some rules. And of course, uh, you can accelerate up to a point and um, then uh, if you are a certain distance from the next car, you slow down. They put in some reasonable rules and try to see if uh, this sort of interacting random walk model of traffic uh, would work. And then they plotted all these well lines, meaning x versus t, uh, and tried to compare with real traffic. And it was nothing like it, it just qualitatively different. So then they went back to the drawing board, and they didn't know what to do. Until one day they had an idea, look, we've put in a lot of the real thing into a model. But you know, in the end, cars are driven, at least till this day, by human beings. <laughs> and uh, they're unpredictable. I mean, if you've ever driven, you know the person in front of you for no reason will put on a brake. I mean, brake. So they put in a very tiny amount of random braking in the model. And immediately the well lines look totally like real traffic. So much so that the authorities in Essen began to use their model for uh, predicting what will happen on German highways. And uh, it worked. You know, if an outside agency like that uses your model, it must be quite good. Of course, there's a further addendum. So then they put it on the internet or something. I, I don't know if the internet existed in those days. Now it is pervasive, anyway. Uh, so it was on the internet, and then they, you know, for the, you know, so that everybody can see what what is going to happen one hour from now. But then, what do you do? You have to go from Essen to Düsseldorf. You can go either by Route A or Route B, right? Prediction: Route A is thirty minutes faster. So now, what should you do? Should you take route A? If you're simple and straightforward, you will. But then people began to think, but everybody is looking at this. <laughs> so let me be a little more clever and take route B. But then, you know, second thought occurred to them, but others are also thinking the same way. <laughs> so they got into an infinite iteration, you know, A, B, B. 
whatever. Some people liked an odd number of iterations, some people liked an even number, some then they stopped. Okay. Anyway, what did people actually do? So they took a survey. So they found there are three classes of people. One took A because they iterated that number of times. Two, four, six, or one, two, three, what? Others took B because it was two, four, six. What about the third class? Third class they knew knew there's something, but they didn't. You know, they just went there and last minute they decided on the. They, you know, they didn't much care for the prediction. So, so that is what actually happens. So I don't know whether all these things <laughs> do much good. <laughs> That, 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 that is the story. Now, uh, yeah, so you had asked me, right? So I don't know if this answers your question, but right. Anyway, since uh, we've uh, talked about current, let me also, in fact, address the current here in this model. So now I want to change something a little bit in this uh, problem of the biased random walk. Not too much, but uh, a little. And actually, so the although it changed something very little, the effect will be huge. And the what I'll change is the boundary condition. Here there was no boundary condition because I imagine the line was infinitely long, and the you know particle can move forever. But uh, suppose, in fact, I have a wall. Okay, and I have this lattice. And I have a bias random walk, but this time the bias is more this way than that. And for variety, let me make time continuous already and say there is a rate u for moving left and a rate, a rate v for moving left and rate u for moving right with u less than v. Except there is a wall. Now, in this other case, you could say there is a finite current carried because there is a streaming of velocity and you had many walkers starting, you know, you could just measure the current there. But uh, here, what will happen at long times? Well, initially, if you have walkers somewhere there, or let us imagine releasing lots of walkers, all non interacting, but all together somewhere, and they will all move around. But on the whole, they'll move this way, right? I mean, on the whole, this way. But then there's a wall; they can't move. So they will pile up there. Question: Can we describe this profile? Let me just quickly show you how, and then we'll just leave it at that. So let us ask only a simple question. We we'll say, long time has passed. We have reached the steady state, and all we want to do is characterize this steady state. What is the steady state? So let Suppose that at steady state, the probability that you are at side 0 is p 0. This is side 0. This is p 1, p 2, and so on. I want to find a formula for p 0. That is and p 1 and p 2. How do I do it? Well, one, in principle, what you should do is you should set up your full time dependent equation in this way, put in the boundary condition and solve it. In fact, if you read Chandrasekhar, you remember the article that I, I really recommend it. I mean, you know, uh, read it. And somewhere he has a chapter on sedimentation. Sedimentation, if you think about it, is just like a biased random walk because gravity is pulling you down in a beaker, and the beaker has a bottom. It's a wall. So Chandrasekhar actually works out the full profile and how it changes as you drift downward, as you approach the wall and finally. But we will be content today to do only the finally part of it, final, what happens in the end. Well, so that is very nice. Is there a game on or something? Right. Anyway, okay. so uh, uh, what happens in the end? Well, very important thing about any steady state. In steady state, the current is uniform. 
must be uniform in space. Whatever the value of the current here must be the value of the current there and there and there. Why is that? Because there is, you recall, the continuity equation. What is the continuity equation? Continuity equation in this context will say dp by dt plus divergence and let me just make it one dimensional dj by dx equals 0. If j is not uniform, this will not be 0 and p will change, but that goes against the idea of a steady state. Steady state means a state in which the p's have all reached the final values they do not change. d p by d t is 0 means d j by d x is 0 means j is uniform. So, in steady state in any steady state I mean uh, this must be respected provided something you have a conserved quantity which we do, but look at the current here there is a wall. So, the current has to be 0 if the current is 0 here it has to be 0 everywhere. So, the current in every link is 0, but what is the current in the k in the link k to k plus 1? Well, so we are looking at a particular link here. This is site k, this is site k plus 1, there is a p k here, there is a p k plus 1 here. We are asking what is the current that is flowing here. Well, so it is clearly u times p k minus v times p k plus 1 right flux net flux z, right, but this we have just argued has to be 0. This determines p k plus 1 over p k to be u by v u is less than v we have started by saying that. So, p k plus 1 is smaller than p k makes sense because it should be large here pile up less here, less here, less here. This of course, means that you can iterate. So, p k is p 0 times u plus let me just get it right u by v raised to the power k. Okay. We can even normalize and use the fact that summation p k should be 1. There is a nice geometric series waiting for you. You can sum it in your head and find that p 0 is uh, 1 minus u by v. Okay. So, this solves the problem. This solves the problem we had posed in the beginning namely what is the value of p 0 and therefore, now we have actually found p k everywhere. I just point out that this is actually familiar to you perhaps I do not know. If you rewrite this as p naught e to the minus k divided by some thing. Okay, let us just call it L bias, which you can always do right. I mean u by v is less than 1 something to the power k I can write as e I mean my prerogative I can I mean why not I want to. So, uh, and of course, if you do that you find that L bias is equal to minus 1 over log u by v, which actually in the continuum limit becomes just our length that we had derived in the other case d by c. All right. Now, why did I say it may be familiar to you? Because you may have learnt in school a fact which is not strictly correct that uh, if you look at the density of the atmosphere above the earth's surface that falls exponentially. Did anybody learn any such thing? Mm, the mild nods here and there. Okay. All right. I mean, so this is not strictly true because there are all sorts of complicated things that happen once you go a few kilometers above uh, this, but okay. as an ideal atmosphere would, would actually fall exponentially and this is actually what is happening here this bias is produced by the earth's field except earth's field I mean earth has been rotated this way I mean usually you are used to looking at it downward. You can match 
mgh to the value of the bias. It's not very difficult, and the temperature, and so on. So, this is the thing I wanted to convey to you. All right. Okay, so this is an example of a biased random walk which actually reaches a steady state and the steady state is simple exponential pile up it relates to something or the other. It would relate also to anything driven by a field. The, we have not said it has to be a gravitational field, it could be an electric field or whatever and these could be charges. We expect some exponential pile up like this provided we can treat the carriers as classical. Okay, so, uh, before I take up that last bit of the uh, lecture, let me ask if there are any questions on this part by a random box. You know, so these are things that have been worked out many, many years ago, well summarized by Chandrasekhar in 1943 and therefore worked out even earlier. Smaller Chowsky and others were the people who actually made a lot of progress in these problems. But, uh, uh, as I said, in recent years, the focus in random walk theory has been on the properties of interacting random walks. So, let me just tell you all something in three minutes and then switch to the other problem about gambling very soon. So, the uh, yeah, can we start putting no, well, maybe yeah, can we st shall we start one minute? Yeah, can we start putting on that one? Thank you. Sorry, uh, sorry for the inter yes. Yes. Yes, you're right. First thing, the current must be uniform. For instance, if this same problem I repeated, and I had a ring geometry periodic boundary conditions. Then indeed, I will set up a current and it will keep flowing without stop in steady state. Okay, so And it will be uniform. So, the fact of uniformity is a very general thing. It is true in every steady state, but I am now second using the fact that I have a wall. So, now I am saying it is uniform and now second thing I am saying is because there is a wall, the current has to be 0. If it is not 0, that means particles are going through the wall. I mean my definition of wall is that particles can, cannot go through it. Okay, so, that, that is the argument. So, that is the second bit of the argument. So, the current has to be 0 here, but, but because it is uniform, it has to be 0 there also and therefore this. Okay. All right. Now, uh, so I was telling you about um, interacting random walks. How do random walkers interact? Well, it depends on your situation. If you take very literally Carl Pearson's thing about the drunken man. Okay. So, imagine a lot of people leaving a bar. So, they all sort of staggering <laughs> around and they are sort of hitting each other. <laughs> Have you done that? <laughs> so, if you look at the world lines, this is x, this is t. You know, normally a random walker would have done that, but here these guys are constrained by each other, they cannot go through, so they keep bumping into each other. So, they are constrained. Question How does the root mean squared displacement grow in time? Answer t to the 1 quarter. How do we know? It can be worked out. I am not going to work it out, but it is a nice result, the result of caging. But now, suppose these were, you know, these guys have come out with the carrying guns. You bumped, you shoot each other. You know, so, these are called annihilating random walks. So, you can imagine otherwise them to be electrons and positrons, you know, for instance, they annihilate or in many chemical reactions, etcetera. So, these are of course, I am putting it very 
you know uh, likely, but uh, these are serious applications of random walks. So, the interactions could be exclusion, could be annihilation. Uh, could be aggregation, if two things meet then they stick and then they move together. So, these things the reason these are important is because all these happen in one context or the other. In fact, colloids often aggregate and you know this is a very important uh, process and there are three or four more things you can put down. So, these are matters of current research and people are working on these problems and there are partial answers to many things and they are very interesting effects. It is a new way to model interactions. We are used to modeling interactions through the Hamiltonian. This is through the kinetics. In the kinetics which is a stochastic kinetics we are saying okay, this can happen it is a process and uh, so be it. Okay. So, these are interesting problems and there are very interesting answers also, but this is not the time to. Uh, I well when I say this is not the time, I mean we do not have the time to get into this. This is, this is always the time actually, but we do not have the time. Uh, yeah, so yes and no, I mean the um, directly of random walk theory none, but I will tell you another s story. Uh, in Cambridge University was a famous person named Sam Edwards, very famous for his work on polymers, on rubber and this and that. Where did Sam Edwards get his ideas from? Always by going to factories. He was, con he was a consultant for many factories in Britain and every month or every two months he would go and sort of listen to them. I do not know whether he solved any of the problems, he probably did he because he was very astute but also it went the other way because he got many ideas from industry. And one of the ideas he had was that when grain falls you know uh, on uh, so, there, there are all these undulations because you cannot control them they are random. And uh, um, so, the industrialists did not like the undulations and they basically asked him how do we get rid of them. But first of all he felt that before getting rid of them he should understand how big they are. So, he devised what is known as the Edwards Wilkinson model which actually has a very intimate connection to random walks. Now, finally I do not know what happened to the industry, but the Edwards Wilkinson model certainly took off. So, <laughs> so it is not a real answer to your question, but uh, no, but in fact Edwards and perhaps Dijen are the best uh, people who carried this forward. So, Edwards's models of rubber you know as branching objects not random walks alone, but little much little more this is a similar thing had huge impact because you know in rubber when you you know if you just take the polymer and just use it it won't work. You have to vulcanize it by putting some sulfur. Vulcanization causes bonding between some of these branches. Now, again I do not know enough in, in enough detail, but Edwards did a huge amount of work on rubber elasticity from the basic point of view. So, again I cannot vouch that it actually affected industry, but uh, and the third thing of course, is this huge reduction of viscosity in a turbulent flow by putting in a little bit of polymer that reduces the viscosity hugely because of polymer entropy. So, so, there are odd examples like that, but nothing, but, uh, but the question is very important for us in this day and age to know the answer to. So, I will try to find out, I mean also, but so should all of you, I mean please, yeah. Okay. All right. So, here we are, now we are tossing the coin, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean I will operate, uh, I just have to put one click down, no? Yeah, okay, right now put it on top, yeah. So, can you all see this uh, sequence here? Huh. Okay, so first of all I want to draw your attention to this book that has been handed out to the registered participants. It is a book by William Feller and I would again, you know, I mean you are being urged left and right by me and all the <laughs> other lecturers to read a lot of books. 
please add this to your list of must reads or must flip through. Okay. You, it's one of these books which has lots of examples. You can, uh, you know, have a fascinating time with them. But amongst other things, it has a chapter on what's it called? Ah, it's called coin tossing. I think. Yeah. It's called coin tossing and long leads. I think. Okay. So anyway, so Feller discusses coin tossing in some detail. Now, here is the answer, in, in not, not an, an answer, a, a sequence of what happened when a coin was tossed 10,000 times. Okay. Notice that the scale keeps changing. On top it is, yeah, thank you, it goes from 0 to 500 uh, and then here by the time you reach 1000 it goes to 6000 and this is so, this something has happened. I mean, this is a, you know, expanded scale. The most uh, striking, okay, what are we plotting? So, shall we use our names? This is Mukunda versus me. <laughs> and see, Mukunda is winning here. This is the extent of his winning. So, what we are plotting is how much somebody is winning by as a function of the number of tosses. So, the first thing is that okay, I, I lost and I had to wait for about a hundred odd tosses before it equalized. Okay, and then it went on, then the lead kept reversing. And then look at this. Now, he uh, is winning and it goes on and on for three, four hundred tosses. Okay, then for a while I have a lucky streak. <laughs> and then look at this, three thousand tosses. I mean, he is winning. It is not that he is getting heads e each time, heads and tails, but he is in the lead. So, if you have 5 head, you know, rupees already and then you lo lose 4 times, you are still in the lead. You know. So, what is surprising is these long stretches where the lead does not change. One person who is winning keeps winning. Oh, hi. Yeah. You know, so now let us derive this as a formula. Okay, so now actually the best thing is to read uh, what he's written here. So fellow is very angry at all the statisticians that he talked to. So he said that even trained statisticians. So he said in a, this ten thousand, you know, tosses there were seventy-eight changes of sign. Actually, most of them occurred here very fast. Then there were long leads, but he said trained statisticians did not expect uh, 78 changes of sign and nobody counted on the possibility of only 8 changes. Where were the 8 changes? I will show you in a minute. But he says neither should cause surprise. If they seem startling, this is because of faulty intuition. Okay, that we can admit to and our having been exposed to too many vague references to a mysterious law of averages. What is this mysterious law of averages? The moment I lose, I feel I'll, I can easily get back. That is wrong. You feel that on, on average it must even out. If he's won so many, I must. Yeah, I mean it will even out, but it will not mean that you match the lead. You, that the lead will reverse. So, you have to ask a precise question, get a precise answer and <coughs> relying on intuition is not the way. Okay. Uh, so, this is, so this one with eight things is just the same sequence, but in reverse. You, somebody was winning at the end. Suppose you put the 0 bar over there at that point and you ask how many leads are there if you look at it in reverse. Oh, I, I did not manage to go down. What happened? Ha has it come? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. So, that is even more shocking because the lead stays so long with one person, it changes only 8 times in 10,000 tosses. So, this is just to make the point that 
there are such things as long leads and they are very long. The question is why and how. So, now we try to give the answer. We have 25 minutes. Yeah. Okay. We will go a little fast, but I will put everything down. We will prove, we will ask the question in random walk language, what is the probability of first returning time or the of first return first return what is the probability of the first return happening at time 2 n. Why am I saying 2 n? Because I am starting at the origin. If I have to come back to the origin, 0 is an even number. I have to have an even number of steps and so I may as well call it 2 times something. So, I am asking what is the probability that the first return to the origin has happened at time n. I am not asking what is the probability to be at site n. That we have worked out long ago. But now I am asking a question about the time. What is the probability of the first returning happening at time to n? As Mr. Mukunda said, the best way to figure things out is to ask for the normalization. Probability should add up to 1. Which probability? So, the answer is that if this answer to this question is something, let us call it, uh, I have to have an Okay, some p, p to n, then sum over n of p to n should be 1. So, that is the probability, not a sum over space. Right. So, I will also give you the answer. The answer is probability of first return, this probability, I will not write it again is given by u 2 n minus 2. It is a remarkably simple formula. I think first actually derived by Feller u 2 n minus 2, where u 2 n is 1 over 2 raised to 2 n 2 n c n. This is the answer. All right. Will now the rest of the class I'll derive this. Notice that u two n is a very simple, simply interpreted object because it is. You know, this is the probability of being at the origin in our old uh, question, like at at a certain time two n. What is the probability that I am at the origin? as opposed to other space points. The answer is exactly this. This is the binomial that we worked out last time. We called it N C, N -C M 1 over 2 to the n. You remember this. n is 2 n, this n is 2 n, this m is n because it is half, it is at the origin. Have you all made the link? It is yesterday's thing with new notation. This is true, but this is not obvious. I am going to prove it. Okay, but the answer is this simple. Okay, so let's let's prove it now. So I have to prove it in five steps. Five, you know, there's this movie. Five easy pieces. So we will do that. One, two, three, four, five. A. So five will take you up to E. A. A is something called the reflection theorem. And you will find a very nice and simple and clear account in Chandrasekhar's article. But let me tell you anyway, it is a beautiful theorem. I, I do not think it is due to Chandrasekhar, but he writes it down. Look, suppose this is x and this is t. This is not, not the normal way we plot well lines. So, let us do it like this. And we start from a point A, which has some coordinates t and x here. 
and it goes like that. Suppose so, I'm drawing up a trajectory from A to B. So this is a walk. In what sense? This is time or n, small n, if you like, and this is going up or down. This is up, down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a typical walk. Okay. Suppose I ask the question. How many paths are there from A to B? Okay, A and B have certain coordinates. Okay, like this will be t one x one, that will be t two x two. So it's like a path, right? But I want to count the number of paths, and that to the ones that don't cross the origin. If they don't cross the origin, they have to be above this. How many such paths are there? Well, so the first thing is that in order to find all the, num the full number of paths from A to B is very simple. That we have already done with the factorials and all that. So, but how do we find this one with this constraint? So, this is a beautiful principle. It's called the reflection principle. Let me put a few le lesson these things so that I can. What you do is you look at the first time you crossed. And you reflect, so you reflect this, that, that, that. Okay, I'm not sure I'm reflecting very well, but here. Okay, whatever was there, I've tried to do a reflection. I, I, I'm not doing it perfectly right, but you reflect. Imagine putting a mirror there and reflect. Okay, so in the process, this point A will go to some point A prime, which will be the same time coordinate, but x will go to minus x. Okay, so then the number of paths from A to B which do cross the T axis is n a prime b. Okay, I haven't defined n. Let me do it. Okay, let me do it right here. Let n a b number of paths unrestricted from a to b. Okay. Now, why is this is easy to compute n a b all paths are counted that that is easy to find we will find it in a minute. Why is this true? This is true because there is a one to one correspondence between every path that goes from a to b you know in uh, uh, um, uh, Cross, uh, which cuts this axis and a path which started from A prime and went to B. Any path that goes from A prime to B must cross the axis somewhere. And using the reflection principle, there is a one to one correspondence between paths of the from A to B which cross the axis and with a path from A prime to B. Convince yourself. This is plausible and you can convince yourself. This is statement clear. So, what I am saying is I want the number of therefore, the number of paths which do not which do not cross the axis is n a b minus n a prime b that is all. Okay. B. So, we finished part A, we come to part B. Let S m be the displacement after m steps okay. 
So, what are we doing? We are starting from now we are st starting to address the first this is a lemma which we will use. Okay, now, we are starting on the thing that we want to do. What is it that we want to do? We want to find ultimately the probability of the first return happening at time 2 n. So, I will tell you the strategy, I will tell you also the final step. If we have found this, suppose we find uh, you know as I said the probability of not crossing the uh, origin uh, up to a certain time. Now, if you ad advance time by one step that probability will go down but it can go down only because you have actually <coughs> crossed at that time. Up to time n there were no crossings you found the probability. Now, you ask the same question at time n plus 1 and you find it is lower. How can it be lower? Only because you reached at that, at site, at, at that site at time n. So, if you can find this probability of not crossing up to time n that is enough you just subtract off the one at the previous time. So, that is going to be a strategy. So, all our effort therefore, will now be channelized into finding the number of paths or the probability of not crossing the origin up to a certain time that will be enough. Okay. So, with that in mind we ask number of paths from origin to some point n x such that s 1 is bigger than 0, s 2 is bigger than 0 etcetera. All of them are positive let us say in other words all of them are not crossing the origin. So, this is going to be equal to we use the reflection theorem now. Okay. So, let, let us see what we are doing. Here was a general result you could have started from A to and gone to B. We are applying it to the case where we are starting at the origin and landing up at some positive point here. Okay. But in order to do this the first step must have been positive that goes without saying. Therefore, after that is the you know chancy part. So, we are going from here to there correspondingly A and B are identified that way. I am going a little rapidly to understand everything, but try to get the gist. So, it is not complicated, but you have to sort of see that this is so. So, this is equal to n a b I have to put a and b properly n minus 1 x minus 1 because 1 in time 1 in 1 time step I am at site 1. So, I have to cover only x minus 1 in space in time you uh, so, that is why this minus, but now uh, thanks to the reflection principle I know what to do. I should not change the time n minus 1, but I should change the space coordinate to x plus 1. No, no. So, what am I doing? Yeah, x plus 1. Yeah. Why? Because I should start at this point 1 unit away, find the answer, then I should start at the unit at a point one unit away on the left on the other side then find the answer that is exactly what I am doing. There is no hanky panky this is correct. Okay. So, this is path B is over. Now, we come to path C. If, if you like we can turn it off it does not matter if you do not want to do not, but if you can it will be good path C. Is it clear A was here, B was here? Now we come to C.
we will now show that probability that S one Okay, yeah. Uh, so, all these s's are positive s 1 positive s n s. Okay, now, we are switching to time 2 n, okay, because remember that is what we want in the end after time 2 n. Okay, so, probability that all these displacements were positive. Okay, uh, let me just get it right with you. Yeah. Well, forget about. Okay, we'll, we'll now show that this is equal to u two n. Okay, so let, let let let's let's look at the proof. So this probability. Okay, so we'll keep s one positive, s two positive, uh, uh, everything, except s two n. Actually, we want it to be positive, but we'll say let it have a value. 2 times r, where r is itself a positive number, and will sum over all r from 1 to infinity. Okay, so, what am I doing here? So, I am starting here and doing all this, everything is positive. End point is still positive, but it, we, we explicitly want to sum over all its possible locations. That is all. I mean, we are not doing anything very more fancy than that. Okay, but if the end point is at point R, okay, and started from here, this is exactly what we worked out a little while earlier. After two n steps we want to be at point r. So, we just use the formula that we have already, just change the notation r equals this, that, that etcetera and uh, we get uh, So, this is equal to n. So, this is a probability, but okay, let, let, for the moment uh, it is proportional to the number of uh, 2 n minus 1 to r minus 1 minus n of the same time, but uh, 2 r plus 1, right. Num these are the num sorry, yes, I have confused probability and number of paths, they are proportional, but ok. But I can change these into probabilities by dividing by the total number of options, which is 1 over 2 to the 2. So, this is now equal. Okay. So, just try to follow the gist of the proof, do not follow every step necessarily. Okay. But I have a sum over r. So, let us call this, uh, so this is equal to half times uh, sum over r of p 2 n minus 1 to r minus 1 minus p of, so in other words I am taking this divided by this and calling it p, it is a minor notational change. Yeah, this is it, but now see what happens. So, there is a huge cancellation, because I am summing over r, first term, second term, third term, this term cancels the next term here, this term cancels the next term there. All terms cancel except the first. Okay. So, so that is it, that gives you the answer, maybe I should move there.
So, the answer then for this is actually so this was wrong this was half there is a half here. So, we will just show that in a minute. So, the right hand that that that, that Okay, how do I do it? So, I want to come from here to there. You can see the arrow, right? Okay, there we are. So, now, uh, so that is equal to, well, I will just write it half of p of 2 n minus 1 and 1. All the other terms cancel out, and this turns out to be half of u 2 n. Okay, shall I do the little bit of algebra necessary for this? So, if there is time we will do it pending, it, it fits in here. I mean it is basically you have to you know okay, maybe it is quicker to just do it. Sorry rather than writing all this. Let, let, let me just show it to you. P 2 n minus 1 comma 1 is 1 over 2 raised to 2 n minus 1 by definition times 2 n minus 1 factorial divided by n minus 1 factorial times n factorial. This does not quite look like this u 2 n, but it soon will because you multiply and divide by 2 n, 2 n, 2 n. Now, you got your 2 n factorial, put your 2 here, you got your 2 to the 2 n, you got that. So, it is true. Okay. All right. So, so we have proved this, but that was for it to be positive, you know every step positive. We want the probability that there is no crossing there are two ways to do it, every step positive or every step negative. I mean all displacements positive or all displacements negative. So, we have to multiply by 2. Okay, so, that is part, okay, that is not part anything. Therefore, the probability that S 1 is not 0, S 2 is not 0, S 2 n is not 0 is u 2 n twice. So, this is half u 2 n you multiply by 2 because it could be both ways. Okay. Now, we are almost through. So, then why is this what we need? It is exactly what I said. If you look at u 2 n as a function of n, it falls. Why does it fall? Why should 2 n be uh, the answer 2 n minus 2 be different from 2 n? Only because it has reached at that point. Up to 2 n minus 2 it had not reached. So, you had a probability of not you know not having reached, I mean no, no, not having crossed. Now, that has depleted, but it can only be because you reached at that at that very moment. Therefore, probability that the first return happens at time 2 n. Fellow for some reason refers to time as epoch at epoch 2 n. In my mind, an epoch is a long stretch of time, like the epoch of the dinosaurs. Or, but, <laughs> but all right, we'll just call it time two n. Uh, is u two n minus two minus u two n. Agreed. This you have to understand the the argument. I hope you understand. Now, fellow says, this is one of the words he likes to use, a trite calculation, <laughs> trite as in T R I T E, trite 
calculation shows that and it is indeed right. So, I leave it to you that this is equal to 1 over 2 n minus 1 u 2 n. Now, why am I so happy with this? Because you look at u 2 n, this was the probability to be at the origin in our old last lecture. This we showed in the old last lecture falls as 1 over time to the half, 1 over square root of time, which in today's notation is 1 over square root of n. This falls like 1 over n. So, this is proportional to in powers of n to 1 over n to the 3 by 2. This is very important. So, the probability of actually coming back to this point the origin for the first time is proportional to 1 over n to the 3 by 2. But if this is so, then of course, so the probability of returning at time n probability first return as a function of at time n is 1 over n to the 3 by 2. The mean first return time therefore, is an integral from something where the, you know n to the 3 by 2 times d n times n which is infinite. So, this is what I wanted to demonstrate and I am proud to say I have just finished in time. <laughs> okay. All right. So, this is it. This diverges the mean time for the first return is infinite. This is if I started from the origin and I ask how long will it take me to come back to the origin, but what about that other question we asked how uh, if I have lost my, my 1 rupee and I want to come back. The point is then I will have to go to through the origin I mean um, yeah I mean you have to come back to the to this state and and the uh, go one step it is longer ok. So, th that is even longer, but, but infinite is long enough ok. So, uh, this is the moral. I mean, so actually against all our grain, uh, all our feelings of what to do to get back, we should quit, pack, start another game and maybe hope for the best there. And if you win the first time, quit again, you know, <laughs> some, in some sense. Okay. All right. So, I think we will stop this lecture, but uh, of course, if there are questions, we will take them. Mm -hmm. It is turning out to be infinite because the p first return mm. probability that it happens at the nth step mm. does decrease with n, mm. but rather slowly. Very slowly, yes, rather slowly. That okay. is the reason why the average is. You are right. That is right. You are right. Absolutely right. So this is uh, an example of a probability distribution which would. Uh, you know, I will leave out the first part, but will decay slowly enough. Not so slow that it can't be normalized. It is. It can be normalized, but right, exactly. But it's very slow. This is a prime example of a probability distribution for which the central limit theorem will not hold, because the average. Leave alone the second moment. Already, the average is infinite. You might ask. Is there any limiting distribution for probabilities of this sort? The answer is yes. They are well known, they are the Levy stable distributions. Maybe we will discuss something about them in the tutorial. Yeah, I am sorry for the little bit of crowded algebra, but this is a result worth knowing and in some sense worth knowing the proof of. So, read Feller. I have taken this almost totally from Feller. Uh, there are alternative ways of proving the result, but I, I thought we will stick to this partly because you all have fellow with you. So, read chapter 3 and other chapters as well. I want to draw a parallel to quantum mechanics just for 
Ah, yes, indeed, please. Second moment. Won't work. Mm -hmm. And where do these arise, if at all? I mean, the long tail ones. Exponentially fast, yes. Some sort of yeah, a threshold or something, yeah. Hmm. That's that's a very interesting point. The other point, uh, which one might just make in brief, Professor Mukunda mentioned the Feynman approach with path integrals. There's a deep relation between path integrals and trajectories of random walks, and Feynman himself, I think, uh, often exploits that. So, that is another reason why you all sh everybody should learn about random walks. But also in my mind, for especially for the teachers amongst us, I feel this is a topic which is easily appreciated by students and I would you know really urge people to expose them to this, because it also involves a different sort of reasoning than you know, then they are exposed to different from what they are exposed to in other causes. Which brings me to my pet peeve. I do not know whether your university has uh, done better than TFR. I mean, TFR refuses to put probability theory as a part of the mathematical physics cause. I mean, I am going to wage a further battle on this, but uh, 